Hey everyone, welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard. And I'm Monica Profit. And we are going to talk today about blockchain investors. You've been making a lot of rounds talking to a lot of investors. And you know, I hear this all the time, Monica, like, what do investors really want if you're going to be pitching them and you're going to be presenting them? What do they really want? What are they looking for? Oh my gosh. Well, it's, it kind of does depend on the investor. It depends on the phase of your company. If they're the right investor, some of them are like, that's too much you want to raise. That's too little, you know? So well, finding out early phase. You want. Okay. Early phase. So you're not raising a lot of money, but you're raising really critical money that it has got the greatest, you know, likelihood of a 10 X hundred X return. Cause it's in so early. That is amazing money to get. (laughs) Um, And yeah, and as a founder who's bootstrapped everything I've done and is bootstrapping currently, it is so amazing when you get your first investor in, you know, so we just are now are getting our first, our lead investor, our first piece of um, of money that's not mine, (laughs) which is like, (laughs) oh, thank the Lord. And it's so validating. Oh my gosh. It's just like, as much as you get validation by being out in the market and having people sign LOIs or want to do business with you or want to partner, when you get someone else's money, it just, it matters. So as someone who's never taken money before, I didn't realize that, uh, that it was as important as it is, you know? So I think for starters, you've got to raise when you don't have to raise, because if you walk in hungry, they, you know, the, the term shark they is- They know it. <laughs> they know it. Yeah, they know it. They're like, yeah, I can see the skin's hanging off of you. You're hungry. You haven't eaten in a while. Smell that blood in the water. You got it. <laughs> yep. Yep. And so I think you've got to go um, make sure you raise when you don't really need to, because then you can talk to them like an equal to a degree. You know, you're investing in the company actively. You're putting your own money in. You have money to put in. Do they? They can be like you. And then it's not, oh God, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. (laughs) Fingers crossed. (laughs) Yeah. Which I think also comes into, um, into play when you think, how much should I raise? Because there's two philosophies that I've at least been told about, because of course I was a babe in the woods when I started this on the, on the raising side. I was like, I don't know how to make a business, but I don't know how to make an investor think it's a business before it is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I think you got to think about um, how much you're going to raise because that means how soon are you going to go have to go either make sure your revenue positive, sink or swim, or rather than sink, go back and raise more money. And that can take you off mission from the actual business. So if you don't raise enough, you're going to be distracted in just a few more months after you run out of money again. Not that you necessarily will, but you're taking a bigger risk if you don't raise a little too much. And you're taking a big risk if you raise too much and you don't hit your marks, right? So, well, and then this is a real on there. a time management issue at the early stages oh, too. Yeah. And I think that people don't really realize that raising money is a full-time job. And if you are yeah. the if you are the only person in your business making everything happen and moving everything, you cannot do both. And so it really, really makes a difference as to getting enough money so that you can make some progress in that business before you have to go on the, you know, dog and pony show of raising capital again. Exactly. Exactly. You've got to, I mean, basically have two full-time jobs. One is building the business and the other is building the investor base. So it's a lot. Um, And that's, I think, why I've chosen to bootstrap for so long. And I've chosen to bootstrap exclusively in my last companies. It's just like, I'd rather... I'd rather make the business work than convince someone it's going to work. And also it's very difficult to get up in the morning, committed to your mission, committed to your company, putting your own money in, and then pitch to a bunch of people that have no interest, no skin in the game. They have no care about it. And they probably have a lot more money than you. And then they just tell you your idea is bad. I mean, it's just, <laughs> who wants that? Who wants it? I'm like, nah, I don't, not going to talk to you guys about that. I have so a good I have- idea. I have a good friend who came out of the entertainment industry and built a business and, and she always says that it was like, it was like, it was worse coming out and trying to raise money for a business than it was going to auditions and being rejected every single day. Yeah, right. (laughs) She said right. it's like a bigger ego hit. <laughs> Just tell me I have to lose weight. I don't care. I can blow you up if you tell me that. I don't care. <laughs> like, there you go. Exactly. So, uh, so but it's funny. I mean, you start with the question, what are they looking for? And it's like, sometimes you have to be psychic to figure that out because you don't <laughs> always know. You know, they are looking, they are individuals. They have their own preferences. They have their own backgrounds. They have their expertise, or at least they have their experience. And then they go, you know, that, that informs their bias. So aside from any gender bias, just the bias of what they know. I've had one guy grill me on accounting. Why? Because one of his last companies was an accounting company. Ah, yeah. It has nothing to do with my core business, but I had to listen and I had to respond to a bunch of really detailed accounting questions because that made him feel smart. And what did he do? 
turned around. Oh, yeah, I don't feel comfortable. It's just like, I think it's as a, as somebody on the pitching side, as a founder, you need to know when to just go, thank you so much. Uh, my next meeting is coming up. I got to go because you just know it's just off. You know, you don't have to sit there kissing the ass of somebody for, who doesn't, who's not really going to you know, come through. You, my time is just as valuable. But when you find that person and they just go, I get it it clicks. I'm trying to push those poke holes in it and I can't. And they are really interested. That is just like, it's the most validating thing. And it's, it's kind of like dating, you know, you go on a whole bunch of dates, you kiss a bunch of frogs and then you're like, Oh, this is what it feels like when it feels right. <laughs> so do you do a bunch of research before on your, on the people you're, you're um, going to be meeting with your investors? I do research to the point where I want to know what their areas of expertise are because they're probably going to lean on their expertise, especially if they're, you know, they're hearing about a new concept and what do people do, no matter who they are, people like to feel smart. So that means they stay to where they're comfortable and what the things they know. Right. So when the conversation makes them feel stupid or they don't feel like they can ask that question, they go back to asking questions they're familiar with the answer to. And they, it's just, it's just an ego-based thing. So I will do some research into the investors and what their backgrounds are, because that'll give me a sense of, you know, do they know real estate investment trust really well? Okay. So I'm going to use that as a touchstone. When I use my metaphors, I'm going to use that as a place where we start and depart from. So then we're staying in a realm that they understand. And when they do ask questions, they can retreat to a place that we've already re related ourselves to. Not let's start in the crypto world. You know, if it's, if it's a crypto investor, we've got to start with, you know, tokenization and assets and secondary markets and the technology. And that's fine. But you need to kind of know. And if you don't have time to research, if you just say, listen, you know, it's a lot like dating. If you do too much internet stalking beforehand, you don't have anything left to talk about. <laughs> Would you please be willing to tell me a little bit about your background? And then sometimes they don't really tell you the stuff that you need to know to be relevant to them, but at least then you get the conversation going. And more than anything, people do invest in people. So you've got to be dateable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Dateable and relatable. So, right. um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you are great at this. You are great at telling um, simplifying the technology, simplifying everything so we don't feel stupid about it, right? So you, you tell stories and you do all of that. Has that served you well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, I mean, sometimes people look down on it and say, well, I already know about this. I mean, that analogy, you know, and that's fine. And you say, oh, I understand. So sorry to talk down. It's just there are so many people that this is new to. I'm so glad I'm talking to an expert. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And that, I think even though sometimes like this is the thing that I found is that as I've been doing the show and asking people questions, I've been getting out uh, comments and engagement from our community of listeners who are saying, Thank you for asking that question because I've been wondering that for a while and I've been afraid to ask it. Like, there, you know, yep. I don't feel like there's a dumb question out there when I'm learning something and I'm curious about it. But when you're in that room, you have the, I'm supposed to be the expert. I'm supposed to have it all together. And so often I find that when I listen to pitches and I do a lot of that on the, on the product side, right? I'm, I, I listen to a lot of product pitches. And when I do, I realize that they they don't understand the question sometimes, but they don't flip back and, and clarify it because they don't want to appear not an expert. Right, right. Exactly. And that in and of itself is actually the first red flag I have to my, when I sit on that side, and of course I'm not investing in them, but I am like, you know, usually they're, yeah. they're simulated pitches at events and things like that. And so I'm voting on them. And it's usually my number one sign that that person's not coachable and doesn't listen well. And I yep. would say no to them. And so yep. that's a really interesting play is you do need to be able to, to allow yourself to step back from being the expert and clarify questions. Yeah, absolutely. And so say, the, did that answer your question or did we, is there any other part of your question that you wanted to ask and that kind of thing, getting that, what I think I'm hearing you say is that active listening right. is so important. But again, your first question, let's just go back to your first question. What are investors looking for? Gosh, I think it really ranges. I think most people, myself, yourself, all of us included, whether we've invested in an Apple stock or we've invested in real estate, we invest in what we know and what we feel comfortable like. This is now in my domain of knowledge. I feel like I know enough to put my money here. So you've yeah. got to invest. If people are going to invest in the familiar, I think that's where a lot of gender bias things come in because women are not considered familiar as CEOs yet. We, we take up only, what, 6% of the C-suite uh, in across all industries. So like, we are not familiar. But if you get over that familiarity bias on the gender side and people go, oh, I'm familiar with your concepts. I'm familiar with your business. I feel comfortable. That's what you want. So that's why it's important to tell those stories. It's important to find 
their area of expertise and relate this new information back to it. So that they just take a little baby steps into the new direction. And That's then they right. get to assume them and own them and say, now I have ownership of this new knowledge. It's not new to me. I'm an expert. I feel comfortable. I will invest. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's really important. I also do think that, you know, we have to realize at the end of the day, they're investors, they're not builders. And like, this is a real right. distinction. Their mindset is very, very different. So I had this kind of, I, I wouldn't call it, it was like a, a heated debate with my dad um, about one of our shows, um, because he was talking about like, it, it, he feels that the, the lot of what's going on is like day trading, right? So it's like gambling to him. Right. And I said, dad, I think you're not looking at it from the perspective of people who only make money on money. Like, right. cause he's, he used to build oil, oil refineries. Like he was, right. you know, and so, you know, multi-billion dollar job sites and things like that. Yes. So it was really big, you know, big business, but it was still building something at the end of the day. Right. right. It was not just trading in the, you know, in the currency or trading in the commodity. And right. so when you look at it from that standpoint, how you make money and, and what your mindset is, is completely different from you as the uh, startup builder, right? Because you're building something. I thought about something. this even in terms of not just how you make money, but how you make meaning, what you make your life about. I was like, you know, I used to be surrounded by really high quality art because I was always around artists and mm -hmm. I was... And I made better art when I was making it more, right? So I would even notice like my arm would get tired after, you know, hour 10 if I hadn't been doing it a lot <laughs> when I was painting, right? And then I would be like, oh, I'm out of practice. And also the work isn't as good, but then you get it going. And if you really focus on something, you get high quality that. So if I focus on writing, I will get high quality writing. If I focus on podcasts, I will have high quality podcasts. If I focus on a business, I will have high quality business. If I'm a person who's just trading currency, I will have a high quality currency exchange operation, right? Right. So investors are, want to have a high quality investment. So as a builder, you have to position it as just kind of, it's the thing that you're making is now their commodity. Right. And if you don't understand that they are, they are going to make a high quality decision about a high quality investment. And so you are a high quality product. Yeah. Rather than, you know, they're going to come build with you. Not necessarily. I mean, maybe if you have smart money early on, that's a very important thing to get because you do have a lot more overlap and aligned interests. But most of the time you are a product and you have to be a high quality product and they peddle in products and they are going to compare you and contrast you and invest if you're the highest quality. Right, right. Yeah. And I also think that if you understand that, that mindset of I'm making money on my money, that means that I, I have a different risk risk level than you do. In other words, like this was the thing that my, my dad was saying. And I was like, dad, you don't understand like for a lot of these people, it's less than 1% of their, of what they're willing to lose. Not right. even what they, what their, what their livelihood, you know, what they've earned, what their wealth is. It's not even 1% of that. It's 1% of what they're willing to lose. Right. So it's, it's not big for them. Um, we were having this debate about the whole, the, all the people who invested in Theranos. And so like, you know, I was like, they right. didn't care. That was not a lot of money to them. They, that they were expecting either a high return or a failure. Like right. that's the, the, so it's a very different evaluation of it. So it was like, do I want to be in this cool thing? Do I like this person? Do I think they can do it? Right. Like there's a different set of criteria in their mindset. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, well, I think it's really important for us to, to take a look at that within our own businesses objectively. And so I do this is that, in fact, that's what actually part of the reason I'm, I'm headed out on a trip is that I'm going to meet with a group that I'm going to get some advice about, uh, is this investable? Right. And right. That's you know, a, that's is a very it worth thing. it? Right. Because I know, I know that I don't need the money, right? I, I, but, I could use, but I could use the growth. Right? right. I could use the accelerated growth. So the question is, is, is it attractive to someone? And I'm going to go to people that I know and trust to start to ask those questions. Yeah. And so did you do a lot of that? Did you do a lot of that sort of advice seeking in the beginning? No, because I wasn't seeing if it was investable to somebody else. I have, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur myself, I have two speeds. I sit on my hands and I just think and think and think and think and think. And I don't say a word. I don't say I'm gonna. I don't see you guys, it's gonna, I don't, I don't waste my time getting anyone's feedback. I'm a little bit of a lone wolf that way. I just think it through and think it through and people are like, what are you thinking about? I'm like, nothing, nothing, mm -mm, nothing. And then once I've, <laughs> once I've gotten through and formulated, my, yeah, when I have it formulated and I've gotten over my own objections and I truly believe I've got a good idea and I'm ready to make a move on it. And I, I had a good idea 
of Rise Housing for 16 years. I didn't make a move on it until two years ago. So, and I sat there thinking it through and thinking it through and realizing it was a great idea. Nobody else did it, thought they would do it. I was totally happy to let it go. Then nobody did it. Then I started looking at the technology. Then I found the technology. Then I figured out why nobody did it 16 years ago. And then I was like, <laughs> couple, I talked to one mentor and I said, this idea, I've been throwing it out to people for over a decade now. And she's like, Monica, some ideas really belong to you. Okay. This one <laughs> that just is so like profound. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And then I went for it and I didn't ask a bunch of people's questions, um, opinions about it because I knew what it was in my head and I knew I was going to have to overcome the, the messaging part of it once I was committed to it. But before I was committed, I didn't need a bunch of noise telling me, should I do it or not? I needed to convince myself. And once I was convinced, then I was off to the races. That's like from one speed is like sit on your hands and do nothing, but think it all through. The other one is run like hell at it and never stop until it happens. That's it. Those are like two speeds. So yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're right. Like there is that about the business. I would never have done that in the early stage of as a, of our business. That's why we bootstrapped it and formed it ourselves. Right. But we're profitable now, so you know we're in a, we're in a different stage of it. But my my I think question and the reason I'm out seeking advice is my question is is what would make it worth an investor's time? And then the question back to myself that I need the answer for is, am I willing to give that amount of my business up? And right. that's, I think, the, the real question is, is, is what I'm offering big enough for someone that it makes it worth their time and energy and, and their money? That and if you built it to a point where it's worth that. You know, honestly, yeah. I've worked with um, different valuations and different val caps, valuation caps, right, for an early round. And when I found a Val cap that I could, that I, I believed in, that I thought wasn't bullshit and that I could defend when I talked to um, investors, that was when those conversations got some traction. When they said, why are you valued at this? This is why. Why would you cap it at that? This is why. And this is, why, this is what it means to your money when we have this timeline and we do have this accelerated growth that your money will bring in. You're basically putting your money in to grow something and get a really good 4X return in 90 days. Right? right, or in 120 days, or a 10x return in a year. So that this is our this is our roadmap, and we're going to start with this. And the valuation was very important because then you could see what met, you could metricize the growth and metricize their piece of it, and then they could say this is why it's worth it to me. So did you screen those valuations and then that cap uh, with investors, or did you just do it with the advisors? Both. I did it with advisors, and then I went to investors and tried to defend it until they said no, and this is why, or they said yeah, I accept that. So, so you did I, both. I yeah, love that. I started with the advisors because I wanted to have discrete conversations where I could be wrong. And then once I felt like I was right, I went to investors and I tested it. <laughs> Great. Right. I love that model because, you know, because this is the thing is like, we are not in their heads, right? We are builders at the end of the right. day. And if we're not in their heads, we've got to be able to ask those questions. We've got to be able to get that feedback. And this is a part that I find that happens a lot when people are out there seeking investment. They're not listening to the investors. Yeah. They, they're like, oh, they didn't get it. You know, that guy's a jerk. Like whatever it is, that yep. is the attitude about it when really you need to listen. Right. Because we're, there are objections in there that either you didn't properly address in an answer, and maybe you have the answer. It just, right. you didn't express it in a way that they heard it. Right. And so that helps you reformulate your message, get a better story, get a better way of speaking about it, get a better chart if you need it, whatever that might be to communicate better. Yeah. And, or the opposite of that might be that, wow, there's a flaw in my plan that I didn't see. And now I need to sit back, rethink this part of my business and go in deep because if I fix this, now I'm truly investment worthy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, just finding out that, oh, I keep getting the same question. How is this different than a REIT? And I'm like, I need a slide for that. You just need to get ahead of it. You know, <laughs> yep. here's, here's how, here, oh, and then they don't, first of all, then they don't get to ask you a question in a way that makes you have to defend your theory because you don't want to talk defensively ever. You always want to right. be talking about market capture, growth, awesomeness, good stuff. When you have to defend, why not? Why not? How are you going to do this? And how, how are you going to be better than that? Yeah. Bad place to start. So if you can get in front of every one of those defensive objections, then the conversation becomes, how are you going to expand? And then you can really end the pitch on a very positive note. Right. Right. Wow. I, I think this is a really good conversation for us to be having for, and I, I think there's going to be some questions about there. And I think as we move, both move forward in what we're doing, the next question is what's the next stage? Like how is that yeah. next stage different, right? Both of us don't have experience beyond this first stage of like seed angel 
that yeah. kind of, you know, I, I've never taken in anything but angel investors. I've not taken VC money. But um, so. it's not even just the, the post money part. It's like you have, I believe you have built a business beyond this level and beyond this profitability. Oh, absolutely. Revenue. Yeah. So have I. So I think that, you know, regardless of, if, and especially because you're, you're raised, if you're raising, you don't have to raise. So if you do, fine. If you don't, fine. I really just think of it like this. The next phase, no matter who puts money into my business or into yours is, bigger strategic partnerships, taking what you're doing at 1x, calling it 5x, going 10x, going 25x. And you can do that on your own and you should continue to because the more you do and you leave the door open to maybe take investment, the right investors are going to say, hey, how can I work with you? That's the conversation you want to have. You don't want to say that, (laughs) would you please work with me? No, 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 no. How about how can I work with you? That's where I wanted to start. Right. Well, and, and that's a little bit what's the impetus to actually why I decided that I would go through this process of exploring it was because I had so many people saying, hey, I want to hear more about the investment side of your business. I was like, well, there is no investment side. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I did it all myself, right? There's you know? no investment side yet. <laughs> and, and so then I thought, well, why am I saying that? Why don't I, why don't I explore it? Because what would it bring to me? And that was what I looked at is what would it bring to this business? What would it bring to the growth of it? And is it worth exploring? And I came to the decision that it was yes, that I had bootstrapped it and we're profitable. So I actually don't have any monetary needs on that right now, but I cannot grow as fast as the market is growing. So like, that's the, that's the caveat right there. So making a decision for a right reason is really good place to be as well. You know, Absolutely. You can Absolutely. say, this is why I'm seeking it and it's valid and they can see that in the numbers. So, well, yeah. anything else you want to leave our, our, our community, our listeners with? Um, you know, I think that it's funny. I've, I've thought about the familiarity thing and I realized that there is an inherent Uh, advantage that people have when their personal networks are have higher net worth and we all have you heard that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with right Um, and you're also your income is usually the average of the five people you spend the most time with as well so um, the more often you can invest in your network to expand that network to the direction that you that you are going towards it's not just building your business and it's not just pitching to investors you have to become familiar to them and a warm introduction is always better than a cold one right right and knowing all of these weird and just having the table manners to sit at the table. It's really that it's like the <laughs> metaphor is, can you, did you use the right fork, you know, because they're watching you and they do use the right fork because they've known that fork since they were, they were born with that fork or that silver spoon. And to be able to, to move in those circles means that you have to be exposed to them. So I think that not only are we investing in our businesses as founders, but if we're really going to grow and we're going to be taking investor money, um, we have to invest in our, in our networks beyond just networking. We actually have to go, can I make friends with these people? Does this jive with me? Can I fit in here? And what do I need to do to fit in here if that's really needed to be able to get the money out of this community to be able to push my business forward? And if it doesn't fit, if you're like, I just can't listen to you know the, the NRA. I'm not interested in people that are super into the NRA. It's just not my thing. I just know that I can't actually make friends, even though there's money there. So you've got to find the people that align with your, with your personality and what you're doing and your mission of your business enough and who you are, but also I think intrinsically make you grow towards a higher net worth group, a, a more investing group, and also a group that they may have some of your values and it may stretch you a bit. But I think it, there's nothing that's asked me to be, to grow as an individual more than becoming an entrepreneur, because it's, it is a path of personal development. Truly, you meet people that are not just like you. And then next thing you turn around, you realize you're not just like you either. You know, you really grow at a rapid pace if you're going to grow a company at a rapid pace. Well, and I think that's a whole nother episode, actually, oh, <laughs> that sure. I'm happy to do it. like a whole nother episode about how, you know, how you really, uh, so what I found is serving that community. So if you, if you are of great service and you can network in, in a way that you are providing them something of value to that group, because I'm not providing money, I'm not providing, you know, I may not be providing all the things that other people are bringing in, but I've got a lot of tools, I've got a lot of services, and I've got a lot of mind share that I can bring to the table. And when you bring Bring that at a high level of service, of curiosity and service. That's what I find. Those two things, you find yep. them attracted to you and inviting you in, 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 in it's really easy. It's yeah, really exactly. easy to access new communities and, and, and grow with them and learn from them. And, yep. part, and, and that in and of itself is a, probably a whole nother episode, right? Like yeah. a whole nother, we should right? definitely talk about that one next time. Yeah, exactly. So, so future episode for all of you, um, you know, 
if you guys are working on startups, if you're working on seed investing, if you've found some things, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, please reach out to us at New Trust Economy anywhere on social media and newtrusteconomy.com is the website. We'd love to hear from you. Definitely. I would love to hear more questions from all of our listeners. <laughs> That's right. So thanks again for listening, everyone. We really appreciate your time. I'm Tracy Hazard. And I'm Monica Prophet, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys.